Great Plains Nature Center. I'm Deb Williams, a naturalist here. We're here to share with our guest. My name is Eric Schiminger. I'm here with Humankind Wichita, and we want to thank you guys for joining along and learning during Sleep Out ICT. If you want to do some additional learning here at the Great Plains Nature Center, we're open from 9 to 5, Monday through Saturday, and our gift shop is open from 10 to 4. So we hope that you'll be encouraged to come see us after you have had a chance to see our program today, which is about habitats. Are you ready, Eric? Let's do it. All right. So our topic today is habitats. Let's think first about what a habitat is. Eric, do you have any idea what a habitat is? I have a couple ideas. I, I think you know, maybe my house is an example or... Oh, okay. And why would your house be an example of a habitat? Well, that's where I live. I'm sure other, other animals have other habitats, right? Well, I think you're right. So let's look at a definition that we here at the Nature Center might think more of as a habitat. A place where a living thing is able to meet their needs. <clears throat> and sometimes, as Eric said, maybe your habitat looks a little bit different than an animal's habitat. Your house could be your habitat. Um, it might look like um, maybe a field. It might look like um, a tree. So habitats can have a variety of appearances to us. So let's see what those animals in particular need to survive in that basic habitat. In order to survive, they need food, water, shelter, and space. So food would be something to eat, water of course something to drink, shelter is a place that they can stay out of the elements like the cold or the wet, particularly these last few days we've had to worry about the wet. Somewhere to hide from the elements and hide their food from other animals, to build nests and hide their eggs, and they also need space. Sometimes I think of animals as, such as insects only needing a little bit of space, and like the bison that used to roam the Great Plains, they need hundreds of miles of space in order to survive. What about humans on the other hand, Eric? Yeah, that's a good point. So as humankind, you know, we serve people who are homeless and don't even have shelters and space sometimes. So we want you guys at home to also think about you know, if you maybe didn't have a home to stay in, where would you, where would you live and where would you find your food? And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that today and, and look into how people deal with some of their needs. So today we're going to look at different places that animals might live. Um, diverse just means different and different animals might live in those different places. So habitats can differ in many ways. They might have something to do with the type of weather that is present, how much water is around, and we're going to look at some of those habitats that you might easily find if you were exploring Kansas. And even though we have different habitats, remember that we still have to have those four basic elements or components that are available in each of those habitats. Food, water, shelter, and space. Animals that specialize in certain types of habitat are often built to survive in that environment and they have interesting adaptations that help them to be successful. Uh, what could humans do to help themselves adapt in a particular environment? Yeah, so there's a bunch of different environments that we have to live in and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about what kind of environments that we live in and uh, think about as you go through your life uh, and your day, what are the diff different environments you have to deal with that make make your life challenging or make your life easy. So looking at these two animals, I see a polar bear on the left and an African elephant on my right. And one we usually associate with a cold habitat and one with a warm habitat. You might look at the differences between these two animals. What do you notice about our polar bear and what would be a good reason for it to you would think that it lives in a cold habitat area. Looks like it's got a lot of hair to me, so I, I'm thinking that maybe keeps it a little warm in the winter. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. And then if we look at our African elephant on the right, and if you look at the picture and the background in the picture, you can see that we have a totally different kind of environment for that animal. So what differences do you notice there or similarities? It looks like it's enjoying a nice warm Kansas summer. <laughs> yeah. Well, which can be in hundreds of degrees yeah. some days, can it? Yeah. But just 
just like these animals, that animal, the polar bear, is prepared for its cold weather habitat in having that fur. The African elephant, sometimes we think of those big ears flapping back and forth, helping to create a cool breeze. But what could humans do to help themselves adapt to cold or warm weather? Yeah, I mean, I'd like for you guys to think about what you guys do in the wintertime versus in the summertime, what different clothes you are that you wear and the things of your house, you know, air, air conditioning versus heating. Uh, and then maybe think about the people who don't have those things for them uh, and think about what they do to stay warm. Uh, humankind, for example, is a homeless shelter as well as other clothing closets and things like that. So we can help homeless people who don't have those things easily to stay warm in the winter or stay warm in the winter and maybe stay cool in the summertime. So uh, it's just something to consider that maybe we take for granted if you have a house and you have clothes that not everyone has that. Well, now we're looking at some other kinds of habitats, a wet habitat versus a dry habitat. You might notice some specific adaptations that these two turtles have. If you look at the one underneath the picture where it says wet habitats, we're looking at a soft shell turtle. You might particularly look at their flippers or their feet and notice that they have something in between their toes, kind of some webbing, and that helps them to swim while they're um, in that wet habitat or a pond or a stream or a creek. Our animal on the other side, the ornate box turtle, uh, if you look at its feet, they're a little bit different. They don't have that webbing in between and we have those kind of sharp claws. Those claws are good for digging in the ground and helping them to find food. So we're looking again at how animals might look different in different habitats. And maybe you have a raincoat at home that you wear when it's wet out, right? Well, yeah, actually <laughs> I do. And an umbrella that I carry with me too. <laughs> So then we have animals that might look different because they live in wide open spaces like the pronghorn antelope on the left or our animal in the trees here, the raccoon. As it climbs up into the trees, it's got more of a closed habitat and maybe a little more protection. The pronghorn, its adaptation for protecting itself in an open habitat is that it can race actually across the plains. They can run very quickly. And then the raccoon, being able to climb away from the ground and up into the tree, it's helping to protect itself from the elements or perhaps predators that it might be finding. Are you someone you think that likes to stay in your room or you like to get outside and run around? Think about that with your family. And, and uh, I know I like to get outside and run around myself. I prefer that as well, and then especially during this uh, year that we have been having this, um, I guess, opportunity to uh, stay inside more than we would like to. It's uh, you really need to push yourselves to get yeah. outdoors, don't you? Yeah. So in Kansas, we have three uh, major habitats, and we're going to list them here. We have the grasslands, the woodlands, and the wetlands. And if we look throughout Kansas, we can really find these habitats all over the place, even though we kind of define them in, in a particular place too sometimes. So let's find out what lives in these different kinds of habitats. So here's a grassland. Gra grasslands typically don't have any tall trees or shrubs. You'll just see a lot of native grasses there. I think the one that I'm seeing pictured in here is big blue stem. If you look at maybe the three prongs or at the top of the grass, that helps me to know that it is big blue stem there, here in the picture. Um, there also might be other grasses and weeds and wildflowers, but they would be as far as you could see. The Flint Hills is a great place to see grasslands in Kansas. Um, these grasses uh, tend to be a little bit different than you might see in other places in Kansas and that they can also be pretty tall and have deep roots. Animals that you might find living here would be like the prairie dog as well as the bison. So we have really small animals that you don't easily see when you're looking out across the prairies or very large animals like the bison. And of course, you're not gonna see the herds of bison that the pioneers or the settlers that first came to Kansas uh, would have seen. They had, all of that has changed over the years. But both species, divide, uh, despite their size differences, would use the grasses around them as their main food source and both are very important pieces of the tall grass prairie ecosystem. Here's a prairie dog home. You don't see all of this if you're just looking above the ground. And if you want to see kind of a, a representation of this um, display, you can also come to the Nature Center and see it. We have it right here in Coke Habitat Hall and you can see how the prairie dog uh, 
separates their uh, home, underground home, into se different rooms and um, how they might store things in one room or another, but these tunnels help to protect them. And they also um, have interesting ways of communicating as well, too. Other animals may share their homes with them. Uh, snakes, owls, ferrets kind of like to share the prairie dog habitat. Here is an example of the prairie dog and how it communicates. Popping its head up out of the hole. That's what I do when I'm checking the weather in the morning to see what it's going to be like outside. <laughs> Did you hear him? That prairie dog's on a webcam just like we are right now. <laughs> hmm. So the prairie dogs, as you notice, he has kind of a tittering sound, I think I would describe, but they have all different kinds of calls that help the other prairie dogs know what's going on in their world. Um, you might find these animals in a prairie type habitat as well. We have the burrowing owl, which is an owl that actually makes its nest on the ground. Um, I think it's kind of interesting that they will kind of use their feces to line their burrow to help protect themselves from other animals. And then we also have on the other side a snake that might use an underground habitat in the prairie for their home and finding a way to feed on mice and other rodents from the grasslands. And that's going to be a cool place to hide on a hot day in Kansas. Our next habitat is a woodland. So you might first see how it's different than a grassland. What do you notice, Eric? Well, I see a lot of trees. Okay. I see somewhere I'd like to take a hike, maybe. Oh, yeah. We have lots of places like this in Kansas, primarily eastern Kansas, where you can enjoy hiking. Although my husband and I just visited a park I hadn't visited in years the other day, Pawnee Prairie Park, which is over near um, Eisenhower International Airport, or National Airport, excuse me. And uh, it's a good place to take a hike, as you mentioned, and lots of trees that you can enjoy kind of walking through and seeing if maybe you can find some of the animals that live there and are finding places to shelter their, uh, their young. Like, for instance, this cardinal. Uh, when we were out at Pawnee Prairie the other day, we actually saw some red-bellied uh, woodpeckers up in the tree, so it was kind of interesting. And then you might also find spiders making their home there uh, with their webs. They um, are looking, hopefully, for insects to come and land in their web and provide them with their food stores. So I think the interesting thing here is to think about how all these different animals are getting their food, right? Yeah. And, and the way we get our food is, is, some, is a lot different how, how these animals get their food. But uh, if you think about how maybe your mom or dad, if you're a kid watching, get, goes to the grocery store, well, what if maybe you didn't have that abil you know, ability to do that? So there's some different things to think about about how animals get their food versus people how they get their food and uh, some of the struggles that we all go through the, the spiders has to wait for a, an animal just to fly into its web and you know we have to have money or other resources to get food so just things to think about as you're listening to some of these different animals and what they do right yeah and also when you think about it some of these animals uh, don't get to eat every day right. they it may be every other day or once a week and like snakes in particular they don't have to eat every day they can survive but I prefer to have my meal every day. No, that wouldn't know. work for me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so um, our next animal is an eastern screech owl. And as you know, it's uh, notice it's making its home in the cavity of a tree. And uh, they have a special adaptation that makes sure that they are protecting themselves camouflage. So they're not easily seen from outside world. Um, another animal that we might see in our area, in the wet, or in the woodlands, excuse me, is the white-tailed deer. And this one's enjoying some berries or some leaves off a tree. So, I don't know, that's not what I would enjoy quite so much, but that's what they do. Um, here's an animal. A bobcat. It's pretty agile. If you have cats at home, I think they're maybe a little uh, athletic like that, huh? <laughs> they can be, can't they? Ah. 
Well, the bobcat has some special adaptations you might have noticed. It's got long clothes, claws excuse me, that can help it to climb up and down trees and move quickly over logs and branches. That's a way that they can hunt for a variety of prey, such as squirrels in the trees or rabbits on the ground. Um, our last habitat that we're going to take a look at is the wetland. And wetlands are places where the ground is completely covered in water for most of the year, not always, but the soil is really totally saturated with water. Um, different kinds of plants like to thrive in wetlands. If you come to visit us at the Great Plains Nature Center and maybe hike out in the trails in Chisholm Creek Park, you can see, definitely see examples of wetlands. Um, you won't see the same kinds of plants or animals that you might see in the grasslands or the woodlands. And all of that water that you find in the wetlands is a drinking source for the animals and their habitats as well. So here are some specialized plants that you might find in a wetland. These are cattails. <clears throat> they can help uh, protect from erosion around a uh, wetland area. They're also going to be good filters of pollution that might harm other animals and plants and help to make sure that things can survive there. Sometimes we refer to the wetlands as a biological supermarket. So instead of going down the street to buy your food at the supermarket, animals might visit the wetlands, uh, particularly migratory animals like frogs and turtles and waterfowl and other, uh, lots of other animals. They can find all kinds of things that they enjoy eating here at this supermarket. And for some of our homeless clients, that may be our emergency winter shelter where they get fed you know, during the winter time or some of the other places around town that helps help feed the homeless. So all different places to find food. Yeah. One of the wetlands that you might visit if you were uh, looking to see what a wetland was really like is Quivira National Wildlife Refuge. These wetlands are rich and vibrant and have all kinds of birds that come through. Again, I mentioned migratory birds earlier, and this would be a good place to visit to see migratory birds. Had some cranes and then some egrets. That's hundreds of birds, thousands of birds that you can see out there on occasions. And another animal that you might find living in a wetland might be the beaver that looks for our, um, its life is primarily in the water. Uh, they, you might look too at their feet. They kind of have those flipper-like feet that help them to move easily through the water. They have oily fur to help protect them uh, from the water. It helps to make them waterproof. Beavers love wetland habitats so much that they will even create their own um, by putting a pile of logs along a stream somewhere so that they can make more of a wetland habitat and help them to survive. So if you look around your house, think about uh, you know what you have that may keep you safe and sound and, and not hungry and, and think about you know what other people may have and what they don't have and, and how we can help people that they may not have all the things that we have, right? All right. I think we might have something fun at the end here. Though. I think we do, yeah. So uh, we'll just kind of wrap it up here real quick. Habitats are naturally designed to protect creatures that need them. Uh, for some people, a habitat, as you mentioned earlier, can be their house or their home. Um, and we need ways to protect ourselves in our own homes as just as animals do. Yeah. And I think we're ready for uh, another one of our naturalists to share an animal with you today. All right. Hi guys, uh, thanks so much for joining us. We are gonna pick up where Deb and Eric here left off. So my name is Emily Davis. I'm one of the naturalists here and we are going to show you our awesome possum. Her name is Blossom. So let's go ahead and get started. I will get her out. We have some lovely food here for her. And we are gonna talk a little bit about her and her adaptations that she has for her habitat. Um, so we're gonna see, I'm just gonna give you just a second to just look at her. And while you were looking at her, and of course, Eric, I want you yeah. to look at her too. <laughs> I want you to think about what kind of habitat you think the blossom here lives in, just by looking at her. So check out her fur, check out those ears, maybe all those whiskers, 
those little feet that she has, that tail. And I'm, anything I'm trying else. to figure out what yeah. that tail's for. That's a that's a fun looking tail. Yeah, it's definitely not a tail that you're used to seeing unless it's like a rat. Yeah. Um, that's normally something you see on a rat. So what do you think kind of habitat that we find our possum here in? Well, I find my possums in my backyard. So yeah. I don't know where go. else you find the <laughs> possums. So that's where I find them. So that's where it gets kind of confusing is now um, possums are found kind of everywhere. They've just huh. kind of taken over. They are very opportunistic. And so they are good at adapting to whatever is around them and just finding food and finding shelter, finding that water. Um, but normally, if we looked at an animal like this, we might think that they are adapted for a forest usually. Okay. So these guys are great at climbing. Um, so I one saw the thing, big claws. You did see those claws. Yeah, so you and Miss Deb talked about the bobcat that had those long claws yep. and was able to climb up those trees. So she does have those claws as well. We'll see if you can see that in our little possum cam there. <laughs> oh, lovely. She doesn't need manicures. That's just all natural right there. And so she has those claws that help her to be able to climb up trees really well. And what's really weird on her feet too, if she cooperates. Okay. So on this little back foot right here, Look at that. you can see, okay, see ya. You can awesome. see a little um, awesome. opposable thumb. <laughs> She's just like, I'm done. Okay. You forgot your she, chicken feet, she'll Blossom. She'll probably come back out. She, she has a little opposable thumb back there. And what that does is also help her to be able to grab onto branches whenever she's climbing. This nice long tail that you probably can't see right now um, also helps her out whenever she's climbing too. So she is really, really good at climbing into trees, um, being able to hide up there. That's one of her shelters that she could find, as well as in other habitats. She might just find like a little cave or some piles of rocks. Um, a nice little grassy area, and those could all be her shelter too. Um, so they are very opportunistic. You might see from this lovely plate of food that they eat all sorts of different kinds of things. So she has quickly eaten yeah. the meat that is gone. She's left her little chick feet she left there. The salad and chicken feet, huh? Yeah, she left the salad. Salad is not, not the, appetizer. <laughs> the biggest thing. Yeah, that's the last thing that she will get to. Um, but she does eventually eat it. It is still important okay. for her. I think she's um, coming back for more. Oop, yep. Yeah. Come on out. There might be some dessert out here, I That's promise. That's what I thought. <laughs> so tell me about her ears. Her ears look different. That's one thing I'm noticing. Oh yeah, so their ears and the tail are so weird. And so they don't have any fur on their, their ears and their tail like you would expect with most mammals. Right. And so that helps her out with hearing. If you had a bunch of fur covering your ears, mm. um, it would kind of dampen the sound. It's kind of like if you imagine putting like a big fuzzy blanket over a TV, it's probably gonna be harder to hear that TV. Hmm. And so this poor girl, she doesn't have the best eyesight. She has these tiny little beady eyes, which is kind of why they get hit by cars a lot. They just, they don't see that well, unfortunately. Um, but those ears and that nice little snout there, those are her two um, senses that she will use as hearing and smelling to be able to find food, look out for predators, um, whatever habitat that she is in. Those are kind of her main senses that she is using. Um, and then of course, now you can kind of maybe see that tail back here, which hmm. also doesn't have any fur on it. So and she's adapted a bit to her, to all the different, you know, temperatures and uh, other, other things that are trying to get after her, I guess, yeah. over the years, huh? Yeah, and so she's she's decently adapted for a lot of habitats. Unfortunately, as you can see, this doesn't have any fur on it, on her ears and her tail. So while that helps her with her senses, this helps her with her climbing. She can hold on to branches uh, really easily. It also means that she can be more prone to hypothermia. And so she doesn't have that fur covering it. So these little bits right here can get really, really cold and chilly. Um, when you go further north and find possums up there, a lot of times they have just bits of their tail or bits of their ears missing um, because they just have a really hard time staying warm up there. So usually they try to stay further south in the United States um, where it's a little bit warmer throughout the winter time and they can find some really good shelters. So they don't have emergency winter shelters for possums? No, they do not, unfortunately. Sorry. I think some people love to like bring them inside and keep them warm, yeah. but that's not necessary. If they're living around you, more than likely they are able to survive. So don't bring a pet possum. Don't in. do it. We got really lucky with this one. She's very, very nice. She seems but very sweet. We raised her from a baby. Uh, she doesn't really like to be pet, no. She'll, she's <laughs> kind of like <laughs> occupied with food, but she like shrinks away. It's not her favorite. Um, so they're, this is definitely not a good pet, but they are very good at surviving in the wild where they belong. Um, because 
I'm sure you've probably seen pictures or something of like possums in trash cans or, you know, just associating with them with garbage. Wherever they will, there's food, huh? Wherever there's food, they are happy to eat it. So she's got her veggies, got her meat, got some cat food here that she's also eating. So um, they are omnivores. So they just eat a little bit of everything. Um, so they are just very adaptable little animals that are able to survive out in the wild. So they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, this one right here, um, the reason that we have her is that she, her mother got hit by a car, so she was actually found in the mother's pouch. So these guys, weird thing about them is that they are marsupials. And so they are like kangaroos. They do have a pouch that holds the babies inside of them. Um, so it's our only marsupial in North America. Um, so she was found in that pouch still alive. They, she was brought to a rehab facility and then she just wasn't able to take care of herself. She didn't know how to survive um, because she wasn't able to learn from her mom. So that's why we have her here at the nature center um, just to keep her safe and help her live out her life while she's, while she's around. What do you think Blossom? Yeah. Enjoying your dinner? <laughs> so these are pretty cool creatures that are really good at surviving in whatever habitat they have, but definitely forests are going to be one of their favorites. So before we close up, do you happen to have any more questions about our blossom possum? I don't. I think we're going to hang out for a little bit after this, though. Yeah, she's she's pretty cool. I like I like her a lot. So thank you so much for joining us for this possum program where you've learned about habitats as well with Miss Deb. Next, what you're gonna be doing is a little bird's nest craft where you're gonna be making the shelter um, that a bird would have within their habitat. So thanks so much and enjoy. All right. Our bird nest yep. here. Yeah, it's another example of a habitat. Hopefully you guys found some fun things around uh, your backyard, or around your house to, to help build your nest. And uh, we're gonna give it a shot. I don't yeah. know. We'll, we'll, we'll see, see how good our nest is. <laughs> Hopefully your nest turns out better than ours. <laughs> so, okay, so I think we should start. With birds probably build like, a base first, yeah, huh? Yeah, with the twigs okay. here. Got some twigs. Yeah. Kind of looks like they kind of find whatever they can. We, yeah, we should kind of, um, Intertwine the twigs with, okay. you know, you're, so they hey, kind you you of the attach themselves. Birds usually use whatever they can really find to create a good base nest for their eggs. And depending on where they, you know, are living up in a tree, they kind of need like a sturdy base so like the wind doesn't kind of blow them out of the tree. Or maybe if their nest is uh, down like on the ground somewhere they want to kind of camouflage it with the you mean all birds the don't live in bird houses they do not that oh. is actually you know more of a fancy fancy area for them to live bird mansions yeah all right bird. what's next some of this moss maybe moss, yeah how are we doing so far better or worse than you guys yeah, does it look does it look good <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Decorate it with some leaves. Oh, so it's going to be a fun nest. Oh, maybe we could have used the leaves for the... As the base? Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, it's starting to look like a nest. Yeah, I'm seeing potential here. This is a good reminder. There's all different kinds of habitats, right? And... Some, some of you may live in a house, some may live in an apartment. You know, we have our homeless neighbors that we've been talking about through this program that may not have a house or apartment. And, uh, and so it's just a, a fun reminder of all the different ways and animals and people live. Okay. How are you doing? I'm seeing. I'm just throwing I'm, things on top at this point. I, <laughs> it looks comfortable. You're putting some padding on there. Yeah. A little mattress, huh? Yeah, I, yeah, I can see it. You see it? And okay, let's make a little, you know, area for the eggs. Feathers will keep them warm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, say these are our eggs. Yeah, perfect. Why not? Look. Look how comfortable that is. I'm proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da. Yeah, look at that. All right. Oh. Is it going to move? <laughs> I don't know how stable our nest is. Let's see. 
There we go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, so if you're kind of looking for a little inspiration besides what we made with our own hands nest, um, birds are usually a little bit better at making nests, so here's just a better close-up of how do they do it? The nest. So they use, <laughs> you know, I'm not a bird, but I believe that they kind of find, you know, their own little like grasses and twigs and you know, they use some of their feathers actually um, to kind of stick everything together and make it pretty sturdy. Um, so Looks comfy. Yeah, I would say it's pretty comfy for these little eggs to lay in. So this one's mainly just, you know, little grass, dried out grass that they kind of intertwined together and made a little, you know, safe area for the eggs to let be sitting in. I'd say birds are better making nests than yeah, we are. Yeah, definitely. That's their expertise. And then this one, this is a barn swallow nest and it's mainly mud hmm. stuck together with some grass in between, and then you can see some feathers on the inside to keep the eggs warm. So for inspiration, go outside and uh, try and find some more grassy uh, things or twigs that you can kind of intertwine your nests together with. Okay, that, that's the nest building activity, <laughs> and uh, we hope you guys had fun. Thank you all for joining, and I want to thank the Great Plains Nature Center for hosting the event today. We hope you all learned a lot about habitats and about your homeless neighbors. If you haven't got, yet gotten your event box, you have still a chance to go get it. Uh, go to sleepoutict.org if you still want to get it. Remember, the live event is on April 17th. We look forward to the event and look forward to all the other activities and things coming up in the future, so stay tuned.